Open your Bibles, if you will, to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. We will begin re reading in the first verse, and we'll be reading through the 16th verse. And we'll be ministering on and talking about um, growing up in Him. Now, whether this becomes a one sermon series, uh, one sermon message, or a couple sermons, or whatever, we'll find out. But uh, growing up into or in Him, praise the Lord. And uh, let's let's begin with verse one. It says, "I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love." Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body and one Lord, uh, I mean, I'm saying one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it first, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That is quoting Psalm 68, 18. He that descended into the same is also the, that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or better translated mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ. For from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Praise God for His Word. Everybody say, God's, God's Word is good. All right. Um, as Paul starts out this chapter, and I understand Ephesians is, is a uh, two two theme book where I say not th it's two theme or, or divided into two parts really. the first three chapters we, now when we teach when we teach on the subject of grace we kind of set this way as God's side and the last three chapters was man's side um, the complete biblical library the theological theological uh, description of it is that the first half is theological and the last half is practical which is there's a Godward side and a manward side kind of just the same way of saying the same thing okay so it begins what we call the practical section of the book of Ephesians in other words the first half of the book of Ephesians deals with a theological doctrine, theological positions, theological concepts, and so forth of certain uh, doctrines and themes and so forth. The last half of Ephesians talks about applying those things. You know, it's one thing to have revelation of something. It's nothing, another thing to walk in it. Okay? It's another thing to understand that, you know, a meat cutter will slice meat until you throw a slab of meat up there and start going, yeet, and, yeet, and, yeet, and, yeet, and, yeet, and doing it, it does you no good. So the first half of the book of Ephesians is the revelation, is the understanding, is the teaching of stuff. The second half is the application and making it a part of your life, okay? So that's what Paul says, I, I beseech you therefore that you are worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Amen. And so uh, he begins this, letting you know we are trans transitioning out of the theological, uh, Godward side of things into the application of it. Hallelujah. And notice here that when he says this, and, and we're, we're working our way down real quick to get down to the, the uh, verses 15, 16 down the area. Um, he says that you walk worthy of your vacation with God with all loneliness and meekness and long suffering for bearing one another in love. One of the first things Paul tells us coming out of the revelation side of what God has done for us, what God has for us, et cetera, and so forth in this book is love. Your application is going to start from the position of love. If you're ever going to grow up in Christ, you're going to have to walk in love. Amen. Well, walk in love don't mean I get it my way. I didn't say did it my way. I get it my way. Amen. You know, I, people always want to have it their way. They always want something done, you know, and if it doesn't do it just this way, if you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't, you didn't do what I wanted you to do, I'll tell you what, you've got to be careful about that kind of stuff. When you set the rules, church, if you're going to be a mature Christian, you stop setting rules everybody else has to live by to function with you. 
I'm just fed up with it. I'm fed up with Christians who walk around and talk all this talk about how wonderful a Christian they are and how that they, God talks to them every 20 seconds. Hello. God told me and God showed me and, I and God spoke and God said and this and that and all. And everything that God says, everything that God speaks, everything that God does is to their benefit and it cuts everybody else off of their life and they're the only ones that are hearing from heaven and it's always about them. God showed me I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that and I can. Look, let me tell you something. If you, you can't keep setting the rules for relationships. You cannot be the person who goes around and says, well, in order to have a relationship with me, you've got to do this and this and this, and it's got to be this way, and it's got to be that way, and you never have to give quarter, and you never have to put yourself under, and you never have to expose yourself. That's just garbage because you're not walking in the love of God. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yeah. Paul said, I'm all things to all men. Amen? The Word of God said, Jesus said, uh, greater love hath no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. He ain't talking about everybody. He wasn't talking about everybody going to the cross. In his case, it meant that. But for you, it means you're going to have to put your flesh under, and there's going to be things you're going to have to yield to in order to walk in love with other people. And stop setting the rules. Well, I'm going to tell you what, if you're going to do this with me, and you're going to do it, you got to do it this way. Well, you're not, you're not going to have any relationship with anybody, but eventually you ain't going to have nobody to talk to. And then you ain't going to like you. Jan said, you're going to have nobody to talk to but yourself, and you're going to get fed up with you after a while. You're going to get up looking in the mirror, and you're going to tell yourself, shut up. Now, uh, and, and really the interesting thing is the word forbearing is a social term, meaning that you're going to just have to put up with other people. You have to forbear people. Hello? It ain't easy. That's why it's called forbearing. If it was easy, it would be hang out with one another in love. <coughs> but the very term in itself in the Greek means to forbear, to put up with people. There are going to be folks you don't want to put up with. Now, about four of you need to just go say, help me, Jesus. Or ouch. Well, that's kind, of the, that's kind of the Christian ouch. Help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Endeavoring. Okay. You're going to forbear. Listen, you're going to walk with us. You're going to walk with loneliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, in love, endeavoring. I'm under grace. I don't have to do anything. You're going to have to endeavor. And you're going to have to endeavor to do things. What? To keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Where did that start? It started walking in love. It's going to take an effort on your behalf to deal with people that you don't like dealing with. Because not everybody in the church is going to be just like you. Thank God. Because I don't know if we can handle all a whole church full of you. Amen. <laughs> I mean, the, the world couldn't handle a whole church full of you. Amen. Notice it says here, to keep the unity of the Spirit, not uniformity. The word unity does not mean uniformity. Now, we're not wearing the same uniform with the same haircut, with the same this and same that. I mean, there's going to be differences. There's going to be differences in personalities, differences in, differences in temperament, differences in likes and dislikes. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You're going to have to be able to, if you don't like computer talk, you're going to have to be able to go out and sit down with Brother Bill and have a good time. And Brother Bill may not care about NASCAR. I don't know. Do you like NASCAR? All right. But you got to, Brother Bill's got to learn to be able to go and sit down people who want to talk about, you know, Dale Jr. being just like Dale Sr. and enjoy being with you. See, what we do in the church is we divide and get, get everybody connected in groups, trying to make everybody and get in their little group in uniformity. And we don't learn to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace where we cross over and because of different temperament or different personality styles or different ways of doing things that we, you know, that we, we just can't get along. Folks, we can all start in the same place. We can all start with that we're born again. We've passed from death unto life. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our master, praise God. We're of the same body. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, what would you do if you got up in the morning and said, my hand, hand walked me to the door. And your hand says, I can't walk. And you go, so, okay, whack it with a meat cleaver. You start doing that, you won't have much left to cut off after a while. Best thing to do is cut off both hands first, then the rest of the body's safe. 
So I mean, Shannon got it. That's, that's, that's really impressive, Shannon. You actually got that quick. Amen. We have to endeavor. It's going to take effort. But you know what most Christians do? I don't like them. I'm going to another church. I'm not happy with the way you did this. I'm going to another church. There are people, 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 people that are just like the ones over here. And, it's like, you know, and the real problem is, is you went over there. Because if that's why you're leaving, and that's why you're moving, and of course, we all get real spiritual. The Lord led me. I love it how when people are doing great, the Lord never leaves them to leave. But when there's trouble and there's issues and there's circumstances, all of a sudden, you get, the Lord led me to do such and such. I'm going to tell you what Lord that was, Lord of the flesh. That was your carnal, stinking, nasty, unregenerated, doggone, self-centered, don't want to have to do what the Bible says, flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to submit. Your flesh doesn't want to change. Your flesh don't want to have to endeavor. Your flesh just wants to move on and let the hunk of Dory honeymoon stage take her. That's why people keep switching off wives every three or four years. They wear one out. I'm tired of messing around. I don't want to deal with the relationship issues and trade them in and go get them another one. And live with the euphoria for a little while. And when the euphoria wears off, they trade them out and go get somebody else. And that's they stop getting married and they just start living with folks. Because it's as easy to go through the euphoria of somebody new and something new. But when the real, when, when all that wears off and you got to beat the rubber meets the road and you've got to make adjustments and changes and you've got to deal with personality differences and you've got to deal with all those things you've got to deal with. You, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you something, folks. You'll never grow if you don't learn to do those things. And in the body of Christ, we are called to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That means you're going to have to put your flesh under. And you're going to have to stop giving, using God as a cover-up to your flesh. I know that's hard, but it's time somebody say it. It's time that the church stop using God to condone their flesh. So God told me, and God showed me, and God led me, and all this kind of hogwash. And everybody around you knows your flesh is stinking. But they don't tell you because you go thermonuclear meltdown. Growl real loud. You think you're a Rottweiler, you're nothing but a Chihuahua. Hello? That's the same spirit the devil has on him because the Bible says that when he's thrown into the bottomless pit, the, the church is going to look at him and say, is this he who caused the nations to tremble? Well, anyway, that wizard of our spirit. Pastor, I thought you were going to encourage us. I am. But I'm going to tell you something. You got to deal with your flesh. And it's time we have a reality check in the body of Christ. And it's time we stop using God to cover up stuff by saying, the Lord led me and the Lord showed me and the Lord told me. Hello? The Lord told me to do this and the Lord told me to do that. And everybody knows everybody, everybody around you. You know, watching you walk carnal and act carnal and be carnal. And you, with the way you talk, you'd think you were Jesus Christ walking on water in the middle of the congregation. I had a roommate that had, saw an angel every week. Actually, it wasn't every week, about every day. Every time I turned around, he'd say, well, there's my angel right over there. He's sitting right across the room. He's right outside the window. Where, I mean, everywhere we went, his angel was hanging out. He saw him. We don't have that many recordings of the Bible of people seeing that many angels. I mean, that, you know, we had Joseph that was led by angels. He, you know, he had three appearances, I think. Over a number of years. My, my roommate had three a day. We can get flaky. Everybody say flaky. flaky. All right. So, endeavoring to keep the unity, not uniformity, but unity. You don't have to become a computer geek just because Brother Bill is. You don't have to become a NASCAR fan just because. Who's a NASCAR fan in here? Nathan. Nathan is. Larry's semi. All right. Or either he hates to admit it because Julie's going to poke him in the elbows if she does. She used to be one. All right. So he says endeavoring. We're going to have to make effort. That means you're going to come to church when there's folks in there that you really don't like being around. Shame on you. You're talking about carnality. You can't walk into a church and sit in a church service and worship the same God that somebody else is worshiping and love the same God that somebody else loves because you're mad at them. 
I can't even remember. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know. And if they'll come repent, I'll forgive them. So you're setting the rules again. You're setting the rules again. It's time you stop setting the rules. That's not endeavoring. I'm going to tell you something. A number of years ago, well, about 10 years ago, there was a preacher. And there was something that happened in another large ministry's church that he didn't like and made it racist. And then he began to set the rules for repentance. Now, I know the fact that the pastor of the, of the church that, 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 he said, that he was offended by called numerous times and said, we didn't mean it the way you took it. We were following. You know, they, they said, nope, that's not good enough. You have to get up in front of the church and you have to do this and you have to do that. Who made them God to tell them what they had to do for repentance? What gave them the right to set, to set the conditions upon which they could be forgiven? Hello? Now, it's been, look, I'm going to say about three years ago, that minister came back to the church, and uh, there's, been, there's been a reconciliation. Thank God there has been. But I'm going to tell you, for a long time, they just sat in their pulpit every Sunday morning, every week on television, and said what the conditions were that had to be. You don't have the right to set those conditions. Unless you are saying what the Word of God says, you can't set the conditions for everything. Hello? And they had called them, and they had said th the things. But both, pers both of the leaders of that ministry had called this individual and said, you know, we've been in your home. We love you. We didn't, you know, we, this isn't how it was meant. You know that. But they continue to set the conditions. See, I'm going to tell you something. You run people away and you break relationships and you break the unity of the Spirit when you run around and make yourself the condition setter. You're here to endeavor. And that means you're going to put your flesh under. Hello? And if your flesh is giving you... Well, I'm not, my flesh ain't bothering me. I'm fine. Now, now Listen. At least be honest with yourself, because everybody else around knows you ain't fine. Hello? I've seen this happen too many times. I've seen people who won't come, can't come to church together because, they can't get, because they're mad at each other about something. Well, let me tell you something. If it's more than two days old, you're in sin. Well, they didn't repent. I don't care. You should have forgiven them anyway. Yeah, I'll, listen, you can forgive them if they come to you on a personal basis and, and, and make a reconciliation on that level. Amen. <coughs> but if you're still mad two days later, actually, if you're still mad the next day, you're in sin. The Lord told me, I, no, the Lord didn't tell you anything except let not the sun go down in your wrath. That's what he said. And if you're mad the next day, you let the sun go down on your wrath. The only way you can get, it, get away with about 24 to 26 hours of it is if it was after sunset you got mad. <laughs> then you got to the next sunset to get over it. And that's a little legalistic and technical on that, but I'm telling you, if you get past that stage, you're in sin. Because you're not endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. You'll let the church get hurt because of your flesh. You'll let the church suffer because of your flesh. That's wrong. That's not godly. It's not biblical. We're to walk in love one with another. We're to have a compassion one for another. And yeah, maybe they did you. I've had people do me wrong. My God. I've never met one yet in public. And he said, I remember the one, the one preacher, it took me about a year. I, and listen, I was in sin. The Lord, the Lord dealt with me. He dealt with me. I had to repent, had to repent, had to repent. Had to repent in front of the church. Had to repent. Because I, I just wanted to hit him. I, want, I never had me. No. And listen, that was flesh. It was all flesh. It wasn't spiritual. It wouldn't have been very spiritual for me to punch him out. My flesh would have felt better. Then I had to repent for that. And may, but may have been in jail for a lawsuit for hitting him. Hello? Been on the front page of the News and Record, not for the Church of the Week. <laughs> church News of the Week, maybe, but not Church of the Week. Hello? But people who've left our church and done us wrong and stuff we've seen in public, we don't turn our back and walk away from them. And they'll come up out like we're the greatest thing since peanut butter and sliced bread. 
Oh, Pastor Ed, Miss Janie, we love you. And we're like, well, if you love us so much, why'd you leave? But, you know, we give them a hug. and We don't treat them bad. We don't, we don't dis, you know, disdain them in front of people and put them down. We, we just love on them. We keep the door open. You have to walk in love. Did they hurt you? Yeah. You can't, you can't fathom the way people have hurt us in, over, the, over the years of ministry. I'm telling you, it's been, sometimes it's been rough. Amen. But you've got to walk in love, and you've got you to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Because you're not going to hurt anything but the body of Christ keeping stuff stirred up. Hello. And you can't go withdraw and be in your own little world and do your own little thing. You'll backslide. Usually you're backsliding already when you get there in the first place. I'm under grace, I can't backslide. Hogwash. So he, so he says, keep endeavoring. Remember we talked about this, forbearing one another love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. Listen, there ain't 14 bodies of Christ, there's one. That's what I'm saying. You might leave Faith and Victory Church or go to another church because you're mad at somebody at Faith and Victory Church, but because you haven't dealt with that and that hasn't been resolved, you are still not endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The body of Christ at large is still hurt by your actions. You might feel great. I feel wonderful. Everything is just lovely with me. No, it's not. All you've done is you've moved somewhere else, and it's just going to take a little time for that to catch up with you. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Listen, this does not mean apostolic doctrine that, you know, Jesus only and all that kind of stuff. It is there is one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. There is one Lord Jesus Christ who is the Lord of all. There's one faith, it's a faith to believe in him as your Lord and Savior. There's one baptism that gets you saved. That's the baptism into the body of Christ. It does not d d uh, deny or, or, or advocate the other baptism, baptism of water and the baptism in the Spirit. It's talking about the baptism to get into the body. One God, one Father of all, is above all, through all, and in you all. Okay? But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Let me say this. You're ticked off at somebody else in the church, and God's graced them for certain things. You're fighting against the grace of God on their life because you're mad. You're not walking in love. No, no, no. I'll tell you what. Um... People get mad at people in the church for some of the dumbest stuff. People get mad at people for dumb stuff. Now, one, one, one of our kids was in, in a school, and there were two people in that school, and they got, one of them got mad at the other for one of the dumbest things you'll ever want to hear in your life. And, and when you hear the, what, what happened, you go, that's dumb. And now they don't even talk. They, they were best friends for a long time. Now they, don't, they, don't, they can't even talk because of some stupid thing. And you know what? That, you say, well, that's the world. That's, that's flesh. That's carnal. Yeah, and it happens in the church, and it's the world, and it's flesh, and it's carnal. It's not the love of God. We're part of each other. Man, what would you think if we started cutting off every part that made us mad? How many, how many of you ever hit your thumb before? Now, listen, I, I'm, I've, done, I've done a lot of construction stuff, but I'll tell you what. Sometimes, sometimes I have clumsy moods. My wife says I work too fast. My father-in-law used to say I would never make money working by the hour. If I did a project or a construction job by the hour, I'd lose money because I work too fast. I'm like, let's get it done. You know, and I shot nails in my hand, that kind of stuff. I will never forget one time I was helping someone put a window in and I was holding on to the outside because it was in a window on a second story of a playhouse and I was kind of hanging on on the outside, leaned up so I could get pressure up there and get the gun in the right place. But what I did, I, as, as I, I caught the edge and, and, and set, the, set the safety back, but the nail gun was just past the wood and my hand was right in line with it four inches away. So when I pulled the trigger, the safety had been hit because I had pushed it down, but the nail never went into the wood. It went right in my hand. I looked at it. I was Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, it was right, right in the palm of my hand. So, pow! I'm sitting looking at this, this 16 nail sticking up. And I went, ow! <laughs> I've shot little, you know, finishing nails all the way through my finger, pushed on it, bleed on this side, bleed on that side, you know. Um, all kinds of crazy stuff. 
You used to set up mobile homes and hit my, take the hammer and miss and hit your fingers and your knuckles right across the corner of those number eight blocks and just, just, whoosh. Anybody, yeah. Somebody's probably say, Pastor, just stay out of construction. <laughs> but I, I, do, I do good work. You know, it's just, it gets done really quick and usually there's blood on somewhere. <laughs> Mine. I took a screwdriver on a drill bit, it had, it had put pressure like this, and it slid off. The, the, the screw fell over, and the and drill, not the drill bit, but the, the Phillips head screwdriver went through my nail and through my thumb. Came out the other side. Taped it up, put Neosporin on it, put band-aids on it, and went back to work. Took two years to feel that again. Hallelujah. How come I said all that? I don't remember why I said that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> what if I went, man, that hurt, and, and cut that off, or cut the finger off, or cut that off just because it hurt and, and caused me trouble? Eventually, I'm not going to have enough stuff to function with. And that's what we do in the body of Christ. We start cutting people off out of our life. We will cut a whole church off because somebody in there makes us mad. Nobody wants to walk in love. Nobody wants to endeavor to keep peace. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and one Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. There's one, there's grace given to us. Amen? Amen? We're all working together for the same purpose, supposedly. Get rid of your agendas. Get rid of your stinking attitudes that don't, that don't honor God and quit saying God told you. Let it really be God saying something before you open your mouth and say God said. We do that because we want to validate what we're saying. Hello? We all know that if we're on the job and we're, you know, you're maybe you're a supervisor and you tell people, now, I need y'all to go do this, this, and this, and this. And sometimes they'll think, who are you? And they'll, you know, but it, it carries a whole lot more power if we come in and go, the owner said, and called their name, you, for you to do this, this, and this. That carries a whole lot more weight. And so we, we know that, society, we know that in talking with people, and, we all, and we'll begin to use that, and we'll just begin to say anything we feel or get or, or idea we have, God said. Let me say that. That's one of the most immature actions a believer can take. Because if God said it, you don't need to tell anybody that God said it, usually. Everybody know God was in it. Hello? I, I, we had one person leave, and they, they were honest with me. They said, no, nah, I, I can't say the Lord told me to do this. Well, okay. At least you're, honest. you're not going to hide behind that. You may disagree with your decision, but at least you didn't, you didn't try to hide behind God said. Amen? Amen. That's just a cop-out. Wherefore, verse 8, he saith when he uh, ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And now what did he ascend, ascend? He also descended first to the lower parts of the earth. He did descend it up. It's, uh, the same above is all descended up. No, 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 no. He that descended is the same also that descended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. That's really, you know, if you understand, because it's in brackets, it's kind of a, a, a side thought. In other words, he's preaching. So now, by the way, he that ascended is also one that descended, and he descended, ascended up into all things, and comes back. Okay, it, it's not. It's not that it's not important, but it's not. It's not in the main flow. He just made a statement of, of, of clarification upon when he ascended up on high. He made a clarification about that ascension, and then he goes back to his point. Okay, which is any gain. So let's kind of leave out nine and ten. We're not changing the Bible. It is an expla it's, it's an explanatory clause about the fact that Jesus ascended. So it is doctrinal, it is important, but for the main thought here, let's take that out just long enough to see the flow of what he's saying, okay? It's kind of like he's going along and going, oh, and by the way, da 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 and then you go back to what you're talking about. And that's what Paul did here. He said he ascended up on high, and by the way, now he that ascended, it's also the same with the descended, and he that ascended up on high gave gifts unto men, and he might fill all things. And now let's back to the fact, so let's go back to verse 8, verse 8 and 11, leaving out 9 and 10, not saying that they're not Bible, not important, they are, but let's kind of keep the flow, understanding why he said what he said there. It is important, it is doctrine, it is Bible. 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now an interesting thing here uh, on verse 12 is that you know, a lot of people, you've heard people teach this, you know, that, that the pastor gift is really the pastor teacher gift. And, uh, and, and, you know, you could do it that way, but really, <clears throat> it says here um, that uh, the definite article before pastors, remember the definite article before he gave some apostles, some evangelists, some pastors, I mean, um, some. some prophets, some evangelists. The definite article there is singular before each one of them. Then he gets down to pastors and teachers and says, and some pastors and teachers, and it's plural. So you could be referring to two separate gifts or one singular gift, but the fact of the matter is it didn't go singular when it said pastors and teachers. It said plural pastors and teachers, kind of implying that really the pastors and teachers are two separate gifts. There are people who make a big deal about that the pastor teacher gift is the same gift. Da, da, da. You know, and you can, you can make that argument, but not as well when you understand that because he changed the article also in front of those two, meaning a plurality and not one. All the other articles were singular. Okay, so some, some apostles, singular. Some prophets, singular. Some evangelists, singular. Some plural pastors and teachers. So he's like he's talking about two different gifts, okay? Uh, so just, just for, you know, if you hear that teaching, uh, I, I don't care. You know, it's, it's not a major dish, deal, big deal. But the fact is, you know, not every pastor is a teacher, not every teacher is a pastor. Amen. All right? And, uh, and, and people need to understand that and, and not expect certain things. If a pastor can't teach, he brings in teachers. Amen. You know, sometimes you've got to teach. But there's other of us who would just rather preach. Hallelujah. Let's talk about this. He gave these gifts, but what did he give them for? Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Uh, Montgomery translation says, in order to equip the saints. Uh, Tyndall says that they might have all things necessary to work. Um, Rotherham says, for the fitting of the saints. Uh, Wilson says, for the qu uh, complete qualification of the saints. The 20th century New Testament says, with a view to fitting his people. And William says, for the immediate equipment of God's people. In other words, you get an idea. For the perfecting, the, for the equipping of the saints. Amen? This, this is really talking about for the perfecting of the saints. is not making them perfect, you know, making them flawless. It is talking about equipping you, what? For the work of the ministry. So when you understand that if you took that word perfecting out and put equipping in and said, for the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry. Now that makes sense. It is the saints who do the work of the ministry. Amen. If you're going to grow up in Christ, let me tell you something, church. Growing up in Christ is not showing up on church once every other week or every three weeks, throwing the old money in the offering plate and running home and doing what you do because you're under grace. It is growing in the Lord so that you can do the work of the ministry. You may work a secular job, but you're called to do the work of the ministry. Amen. Not everybody's called to have a, uh, a, a pulpit ministry, but everybody's called to the work of the ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. That, that is your calling. You're called for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's see here. There's something I wanted to read. I'll get to it. I'll find it. All right. Anyway, so you're all called to the work of the ministry. What for? To the edifying of the body of Christ. If we would begin to work towards the edification of the body instead of making sure I all, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. One of, one of the main, main problems, one of the main drawbacks that came out of the charismatic word of faith renewal, revival, teaching era, whatever, whatever, how you want to label it, is a self-centeredness about the message. I'll be honest with you. If you weren't preaching what the individual could get, and listen, understand, you've got to teach things to help people learn to overcome. I get that. 
There's a purpose in that. You've got to teach people how to have victory. You've got to teach people that they can have what they say. You've got to teach them how to live by faith. There's things that have got to be taught. But one of the drawbacks is, is, is a lot of, you start getting people in. And then when you start trying to say, now, now that you understand how to do this, there, there's an application of this. Of, there's still the application of denying yourself, keeping yourself under, doing the things God wants you to do. When you start that, they flee. That's why the hyper-grace message is so doggone ex uh, exciting and uh, uh, exploding and people run into it. Why? Because nothing is required of them. Nothing. They just want to run and tell everybody how wonderful God is and you don't have to deny your flesh and you don't have to do this because you're under grace. You don't have to give. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to do this. I think they're that's what they don't have to do. Paul said, I've made myself a bond slave to the Lord. I'll be honest with you. If you had a real experience with Jesus Christ, you have a real relationship with the Father, you want to serve. Not that you've got to. You want to. If you're walking in a real relationship with him, you want to serve him. You want to honor him. You want to do his will. Amen. You, when the Word of God says it's for you to do something, you want to do it because he asked you to because you love him. Amen. I love my wife. We'll get in bed sometime. Lay down. And, and she'll look over and say, oh, man, I don't have any water. And alarm is set. Comforter is tucked in just right. Got my arms all on my pillows just right. So, my, you know, everything's just perfect. And she didn't say, honey, will you go get me a bottle of water? All she has to do is, is say there's a need. And I'll get up. Oh, you don't have to get up? I'll, you know, by the time you step down, I have to get up. I'm already up. Because I do everything too fast. <laughs> and I'll traipse through the house, turn the alarm off, because we keep our, our cases of water in the garage. And I'll go out in the garage, and I'll get her a bottle of water, and I'll bring it back, reset the alarm, come up the steps, you know, give her the water, get, in, get all nice and comfy back in the bed. And she'll say, oh, man, what's the air conditioner on? <laughs> You hot, honey? You cold? What is it? Hey, I'm burning up. Aren't you hot? No, honey, I'm about to freeze over here. I'm, I'm up out of bed. But do we have to get up? I'm already out of the bed. Down the hall, checking the air conditioner, setting it for her to be colder. Come back and get another blanket. Get back in bed. <laughs> Why do I do that? Because I love her. Now, I'm Ed. I don't have to get up and go get her water. Go get your own dog on water, woman. You should have thought about that before you got in bed. Just suffer through the night. There'll be no joy at Taylor House tonight. <laughs> no. I love her. I will do it. Amen. And sometimes it's not convenient, but you'll do it anyway. Amen. If you love God, you'll do things for him even if they're not convenient. Even if you're always settled down into something else. Or got other plans. If you love the Lord and you love the work of God, I'll tell you something. We've got, we, we've got to get rid of this self-centeredness junk. And all coming together. And listen, and, and here's the thing. You get some of these doctrines, and we'll get down to that in a little while. You get some of these doctrines that come in, and people just gather to it, and all want to just encourage one another in how great their doctrine is. Folks, and I'll be honest with you, that happened in the Word of Faith stuff, and people got over, over whatever in faith. And, and, and look, a lot of things are doing in, in, in the hyper grace we did with righteousness. With the, with the teaching on righteousness. If I'm righteousness of God in Christ. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm still righteous. Remember that, Brother Bill? Yep. yep. We got an excess in that. And it's really just the hyper grace just under a different title. People say, oh, I'm righteous. It doesn't matter. Well, yes, it does matter what you do. Amen. Are y'all here? But as soon as you start telling people 
that there are, there are requirements. Let me say, to walk in love and to edify the body of Christ and to build the body up, amen, and to come in the unity of the faith, amen, or, or, and, do the work, and do the work of the ministry. Well, God just told me just to put money in. That's all he told me to do. God told everybody to put money in. He didn't tell you not to witness. He didn't tell you not to, to serve. He didn't tell you, you know, I'll serve if I'm in charge. You're not serving. <laughs> Hello? What if somebody came to work for you? Say you, say you own a company. Somebody comes to work for you and says, I'll work for you if I can run everything. I know what, the, what most people that I know that own businesses would do. There'd be a footprint on their backside to go out the front door. <laughs> But then you'll get people coming to the church and say, well, I'll serve, but i got to be in charge. You're not serving. You've got to put your flesh under. Amen? I said amen. Doing the work of the ministry is submitting to the will of God and the purpose of the church. And it may be, you may, you may be uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, head CEO of Lincoln Financial downtown, but when you come to the church, you're an usher and not the head usher. You've got to learn to serve because you're doing the work of the ministry. Maybe your talents in the church are not the same things you have outside the church. Maybe you're just a hamburger flipper at McDonald's outside the church, but you're the head counselor in the church because you're gifted. Your, your ministry in the body of Christ is different than your occupation. And just because you can, you, you know, all you can do outside the church is flip hamburgers, but in the church you're anointed to do other things. Let me say this. And just because you run things outside the church don't mean you're gifted to run them in the church. That, it doesn't work that way. It's what God has anointed you to do inside the church. That is your gifting. And, you know, and just because you've got certain talents outside the church don't mean you have them inside the church. And we got we to be serious about this, folks. We have to learn. Listen, you know, um, I, I'm not an in charge kind of guy outside the church. I don't think my wife thinks I am. She thinks I want to run the world. But I, I just, I just, honestly, if I was out in the world, and I wouldn't want my own company. I'd want someone else to have a company. I'd just work for them. I'd rather work for them, let them run it, and take all care of all the headaches and all that stuff. Just pay me on Friday and let me go. Amen. You know, I'll show up and I'll put the hammer or the, the nails somewhere besides my hand. <laughs> And my fingers, and I can collect my paycheck and go home. Hallelujah. All right. And so we have, we're all called to the work of the ministry. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. For the, listen, and the work of the, it edifies the entire body. I'm telling you, when we find our place and begin to do what God called us to do, it edifies the body. When you can endeavor to keep the unity of peace and not be mad at somebody on the other side of the church, it edifies the body. When you're walking to that level of maturity, it edifies the body. Paul goes on in here and says this, uh, till we all come in the unity, remember again, not uniformity, but unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants you to grow up. Amen. Well, I ain't going to church because they go there. I know people right now who won't come to our church because people come here. I'm going to tell you something. Grow up. Not God grow up. Now, you should have had a really good place to go. Amen, preach, pastor, because you're here. There's people who won't come here because they don't like me. Why, I don't know why they don't like me. I am a very likable person. I mean, I even like me. <laughs> Hello. I don't get it. I've had people get so mad at me, and you go, why? That one person told me for two years, I'm mad at you. Why? I don't know. I'm just mad at you. How can you be mad at me and you don't know why? That's demonic influence. To be angry without a cause, that's got to be demonic influence. It can't be anything else. I'm just angry with you. What did I do? I don't know. How can I fix it? I don't know. 
I'm angry with you. Have you looked in the mirror and said, maybe that's a devil influence? We're going to have to walk in love, people. Amen? Coming to the unity of the faith. Not uniformity, but unity. Knowledge of the Son of God. Perfect, mature man. Marriage of fullness of the statue of Christ. Verse 14. What we've been trying to get to all morning. we got, we got praise God, we got 15 minutes. That we henceforth. All this about maturing, endeavoring, walking in love, da-da-da-da-da. Be no more children that we be no more children. Now, the complete biblical library makes an interesting, interesting point that many people want to make the parallel between spiritual growth and natural growth and preach sermons on that and I'll talk about how they're alike and that kind of stuff, but they don't like to deal with the things that aren't alike. Hello? Are you here? They don't talk about, you know, uh, how the, there, there are different parts of that growing is not the same um, as in natural growth. Now, see, natural growth, you're going to grow mod automatically. Unless, unless, you know, you're, something's wrong with you physically, you will grow. You start growing, you grow. Christian growth is not automatic. You can get born again and never come out of babyhood stage. I said you could be born again and never get out of babyhood stage. It's not automatic. It doesn't, it, you have to apply things in order to grow. Amen. And Paul said all these things we've read about so far, beginning to apply the teachings and apply the Word and do these different things are things that are necessary, endeavoring to walk in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. All these different things we've talked about are all there so you'll be no more a child. And listen to what he says will happen. Look, look, look what he says one of the signs of babyhood is, that you be no more children. And what are children done? Tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now I can tell you, I can see baby Christians a mile away because of some hot new doctrine will come along and they all run off after it and don't check anything out. Now, one of the hottest, newest, latest, greatest, which is a bunch of Tommy Rock, Bull, Bunk, and garbage right out of the pit of hell, is that 1 John 1, 9 does not belong or, or apply to the believer. You know, if we, sin, we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If any man sin, we have, you know, so forth. Talking about some repenting. You've got to repent. They, the Christian doesn't repent. The Christian doesn't have to repent. Well, number one, the Bible says never, does never say for the sinner to confess his sins. It says for the, for the sinner to confess Jesus as Lord. Amen. But I see scriptures in the New Testament where we were to confess our sins one to another. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and so forth. Anyway, well, that's the hot new latest grace. People argue about it. You got all these young Christians who think they know everything, all these Bible school students who think they know everything, running off after it, telling, teaching everybody, this doesn't belong to you. And now they have found a Bible. Hello, that has left 1 John 1, 8, 9 out. 9 and 10 out. It's not in there. Say the oldest manuscripts don't have it. Hogwash. You just don't come up 2,000 years later and all of a sudden start dropping stuff out saying it's not in there. But it, see, in order to fit their hyper excessive grace doctrine, they've got to get rid of certain scriptures. And bathe. Oh, look at this. See, here's a. Now, wait a second. How immature is it to jump on something you hadn't studied out and hadn't proven out <coughs> just because somebody came along and said it? See, that's tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Now, the same bunch in about five years when this hyper grace thing blows over and, and, and peters out and becomes just a catastrophe, there'll be some not new, hot, latest, greatest come down the pike and they'll all run after it. Because their babes toss to and fro. And see, the Word of God says, if we do all these other things that first Ephesians 1 through this point has been saying, that we'll be no more children toss to and fro. God doesn't want you tossed to and fro. I mean, the craziest thing in the world is that you don't, you know, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to say anything, you don't have to believe anything, you don't have to act anything, because it's all taken care of, you know. But he says, no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And notice this. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The word cunning there comes from a Greek word um, that actually means to throw the dice means to throw the dice, or the, or the die. I guess one's die, two are dice. 
And, and, and one, of the, one of the things about dice stores is they, they, they're good enough. They're a lot of times they have two sets in their hands, and one of them is weighted to come up a certain way. And, and what they'll do is they're crafty. They'll, is they'll, is they'll, at the right time, they'll throw that weighted set to get the numbers they want. It's craftiness and manipulate and deceive. Let me say something. The Bible says these men lie in wait to deceive. Their goal and purpose is to deceive. Why? Money, 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 money. I feel like me and the OJs this morning. Hallelujah. Ed Taylor does the OJs. Money, 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 money. All right, anyway. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. They don't care the damage they do to any church, any ministry, anybody. They don't care about the, the wake of destruction they leave in their path. They want the money. Honey, whoever said that? Thought I heard somebody say that. They want the money, honey. They lie in wait with the purpose to deceive. Well, I just think, you know, that's hard. I'm not calling any names. I'm not pointing at any ministry. I'm not pointing at any, anything. I am saying that there are people out there who are, the Bible says they do. So I'm saying what the Bible says. They are, are the slight of men who lie in wait with cunning craftiness, throwing the, the dice, throwing the dice to deceive you. Their purpose is to bring deception. And that's why it's important to grow up and not be children. And that's why it's important that when you're in a church, not to be mad at somebody else and not walking in love and not doing this and <clears> hiding <throat> behind God said, because maybe, maybe you haven't encountered the man who lies in wait with cunning craftiness. But he's around the corner and he's waiting for you to show up at the point where you're susceptible and vulnerable and able to be picked off. In other words, he's waiting for you to become a coal. Amen. He's waiting for you to become a coal. So, you know, I mean, what a coal is? Coal is a weak, per, a weak uh, part of the herd, an animal in the herd that's weak. And when the lions attack a herd of whatever, what happens is the weak one usually falls behind or gets separated from the herd and it's called out. It's a call. And it's easy to attack and destroy because it has no defense system. It has no strength. It has no unity. It has nobody around it to help it. It's been called out. And so when you start buying into God told me to leave and go over here and do this, or, and, and you're not doing anything for God. The Lord showed me. The Lord told me. I, I can't say that because I can't walk in love with them. And you get your what? You get weak? And when the enemy starts to come, you, you fall away. You're all by yourself. And the herd can't recover to protect you because they're protecting the herd. The body can't get to you because you're too far off by yourself. And now you become a call who has been deceived by those who lie in wait to deceive. And they're cunning and they're crafty and they have an agenda. And their agenda is to blood suck you for their own purposes. And when all is said and done, they don't give a rip if they leave your carcass to the fowls of the air. As a matter of fact, they'll turn on you. In, in time are you here these people are, are emissaries of Satan they hide behind the cross they hide behind the title of reverend or bishop or prophet they get on Christian television because they work their way in and we got such lack of discernment now in the body of Christ we don't know, people don't know they wouldn't know the devil if he showed up with horns and a pitchfork in a red suit. They think he's the next superhero from Marvel Comics. Hello? Why? Because they've been deceived. They're children. They're children. And they're tossed to and fro. And they're carried about. And men are, are looking and, and waiting, and waiting and waiting. They're lying in wait for these people. 
You need the church, and you need these people you're mad at. You need, the, you need to have a relationship that's, that's right. You can't keep walking mad at some other Christian. I'm not talking about stuff I don't practice. I had somebody leave the church. I called him up one time and said, look, I need to talk to you. He said, now whether I agree with what you did or not is, is irrelevant. I didn't handle it right. I want you to forgive me. They were in shock. They couldn't believe I did it. But, you know, I, I'm in it. I'm in it. I didn't handle it right. Now whether I agree, well, well, I think what you did was right or wrong is irrelevant to this discussion. The discussion is, I didn't handle it right in my response to, you, to that. I, I, I love you, I love your family, and I want you to forgive me. I'm not talking about something I don't practice. You've got to practice that. You've got to be able to walk in love with people. Well, did they hurt you? Of course they did. I'm telling you. Sometimes I feel like the, the guys on the old westerns that walk around, they've got five arrows in their back. And those are all in my back. I ain't got none in the front. They're all in the back. <laughs> Hello? Kind of like Steve Martin. He used to come on the Saturday Night Live and say, uh, I'm just a wild and a crazy guy. Oh, what, what? I, I got an arrow through the head? Oh, hey, I do. That's how I feel sometimes. But you know what? You still have to walk in love. You got to love people. Amen. Amen. You got to love people. Some people, you want to set conditions on love. My, my condition for love is love them. God's condition for love is love them. I understand, like, if you're in an abusive relationship with a wife or whatever, I understand. That's, that's, I understand if you're in an abusive relationship in church where the pastor, you know, t uh, tells you you can't go on vacation and, and your wife's got to sleep with them. That's wrong. That's not Bible. You can't do that. Leave. That's not Bible. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about any kind of weird stuff. I'm talking about within the confines of, of biblical relationships and the church and so forth. That the church, there's, there's too much of church that doesn't do what the Bible says. They're tossed, and, and listen, and because they don't grow and they don't mature, they think they are some spiritual giants and they are babies. And when the winds of doctrine come, they're just tossed over here and tossed over there and tossed over here and tossed over there. And those who are lying awake call them out and destroy their life. Are you here? I said, are you here? Now, <laughs> verse 15, I'm going to say something. We're going to have to pick this up next time. And uh, next Sunday morning, no, 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 no. I'm going, to, I'm going to do this tonight. Come back out tonight. I'm going to finish this tonight. Okay, I know we've been praying, but I, I guess I, I don't, I'm not satisfied. I can't get satisfied trying to say we'll do it next Sunday, and we're going to pray tonight. I, just, I, I want to say it today. So come back tonight. But the, let me just read this part. But speaking the truth in love. That word speaking in the Greek, uh, different translations say it this way, saying holding the truth, presenting the truth. Amen. Um, Warren say hold firmly to the truth in love. It is so important that we're doing all these things so that we're not tossed to and fro and that we hold the truth in love. We hold, we, we hold fast to it. We stay steady in the love of God. Amen. Amen. Why? That we may grow up into Him in all things. Oh, wow. Now, I'm, I'm going to get into some other stuff tonight. We're going we're to kind of pick up here. I have to come back tonight because I just have that impression. Let's face it. We're flexible enough. The Lord says, do it this way. We do it this way. Amen? Is that right? Father, we thank you for the people. Thank you for blessing their life. Thank you for helping them. Thank you for showing them that we need to grow up into him in all things. That we can be, um, that we can be effective members of the body of Christ. That we can walk in the love of God and be blessings in the earth and in the church. In Jesus' name, dear Father, I ask you today that you you've you've taken this and you've addressed people's hearts, addressed their thinking, addressed questions they may have had about other people, whatever, whatever it is that they needed to have addressed by the Spirit of God this morning. You've done it. And this tonight as we continue, you'll continue to work in them and show them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen.
If you're watching by the internet, we just, we ask God's blessings upon your life. We speak life over you in Jesus' name. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord, contact our office. We'll pray with you and believe God with you. Um, office at fbc.org. Or you could call us at 336-8520562, oh no, 0088, sorry. Gave you the fax number, 852-0088. Hallelujah. I'm going to be glad to pray with you and believe God with you. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Say, God is good. God is good. God loves you. And because God loves me, come on, and because God loves me, I'm going to walk in the love of God. And I will endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the, in the bond of peace. In Jesus' name. Amen.